All right, so hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Book Cafe podcast. Uh, in today's episode, we will be talking about this book right here behind me entitled Finding the Gaps by Simon Taufel. And uh, a lot of you cricket fans will, of course, know who umpire Simon Taufel is. He's had a really distinguished career as a cricket umpire. But before that, uh, let me just take this moment uh, to tell all of our viewers and listeners that if you are watching this on YouTube, do please take a moment to subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. And if you are uh, listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, do please continue to uh, download because we will have a lot more content coming up very soon. And uh, once again, thank you for supporting the show. And let's get this particular episode out of the way. And let me do my due diligence by first welcoming the author himself, Simon Taufel. Hi, Simon. Welcome to Book Cafe Podcast. Thank you very much. Great to Looking forward to this upcoming session. Awesome. So thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with us. So Simon, as I alluded to right in the beginning, as a cricket fan, I of course know exactly who you are, but our audience is wider than just uh, cricket fans. You know, we have a lot of people who are book enthusiasts in general. So uh, for the viewers and listeners who haven't read the book yet and who might be discovering you for the very first time, you know, do please take this moment to tell us a little bit more about yourself, you know, your background, where you grew up, what you did, what you do for a living, what you did do for a living, and in fact, anything at all that you'd like to share with us. Sure. No, thank you, Omar. Um, look, I grew up in Sydney, born in Sydney, and um, I grew up both in primary and secondary school uh, in Sydney. Uh, I started playing cricket when I hit secondary school, so I started playing quite late. It's probably a 12-year-old, and um, uh, I did spend a brief time living uh, in Brisbane, Gold Coast. Uh, my parents got divorced, and we had to move back to Sydney uh, after living there for maybe a year or two. Um and so, really, I spent my adolescence life growing up uh, without a, a dad around. Uh, and I suppose that maybe coincided with me taking up cricket. Um, and to be honest, I really found a, a second family uh, through cricket. And, uh, you know, my junior coach, uh, Brian Ophel, um, great man, and, um, you know, just really fell in love with the sport and the team environment, what the sport had to offer. And I actually did some coaching of the junior sides before I left high school and started then uh, umpiring in um, in Barry Knight's Indoor Cricket Centre in Sydney. And um, many people thought that I might have taken up umpiring in the traditional sense of the game, but actually I, I actually took up indoor umpiring uh, with cricket because uh, it provided some extra cash as a, as a young fella growing up and we all need some extra pocket money from time to time. Uh, it's actually where I met my wife. Um, she was playing mixed indoor cricket uh, at the time. Um, so I left school. I, I did a um, Bachelor of Business degree. I left that degree. I went and got a job in the printing industry and then got as far as an operations manager's role uh, with a, a very high-quality sheet-fed printer in Sydney. So I sort of cut my teeth um, in manufacturing as a coster, an estimator, and then a production scheduler. Uh, I obviously found cricket umpiring when I stopped playing cricket at the tender age of 19. And I, I grew up playing with representative players like Adam Gilchrist and Michael Slater. So I'm sort of that vintage. So just past the half century mark age wise. Um, and that was quite a unique experience playing with those sorts of um, players and people as well. Played uh, a lot of great cricket with my club side, North Sydney and Mossman. Um, yeah, so look, I, I got involved in cricket and business that way. Uh, then I had a career sort of uh, critical point around 2002 where the printing company that I was working for was taken over. And at that stage, I was on the cusp of possibly being selected for the 2003 Cricket World Cup. And at that stage, I was only contracted to Cricket Australia. So I took a leap of faith. I left my job in 2002 2003, I got an invitation by the ICC to go and do my first World Cup. And at the end of that World Cup in South Africa, I was offered a full-time contract by the ICC. Now, it wasn't a lot of money, um, certainly not enough to necessarily live by, but uh, it was a start. And as they say in the classics, the rest is history. But uh, I'm now a father, uh, three kids. Um, one of them is about to get married, uh, second son. So my first son, he's a, he's a, he's a policeman. My second son's a pilot, and I've still got a daughter at school. She's in year 11. Um, I'm married, uh, got one wife, uh, one dog, three cats, 
and um, yeah, I like to play golf and that sort of thing. So I've, I've sort of got a wide experience around the game of cricket from a playing perspective. Um, I sort of call myself the accidental cricket umpire because I only got involved in outdoor umpiring by fluke. And um, I'm very grateful to my opening bowling colleague at the Camaray Cricket Club who convinced me to go along to an umpiring course, do the course, uh, got more than 85%, so became a cricket umpire. Unfortunately, David didn't pass the exam and went back to playing. And, uh, yeah, so very lucky in the New South Wales Umpires Association, tremendous resources, great people, and they gave me a start and um, just worked really hard through the CA pathway. And, yeah, that, that's sort of my background and my history and a bit about me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Simon. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you did start out umpiring at a really young age, and it was quite nice to hear uh, what you wrote in the book. You know, uh, it was quite serendipitous. You know, it wasn't something that you were aspiring to at that age, but you uh, accompanied a friend of yours to an umpiring course. And so, as you said, the rest, as they say, is history. So we are really grateful as cricket fans to have had you on the field to umpire all the matches uh, that you were involved in. And, uh, you know, I have to confess that. Um, my wife and my mother-in-law, uh, they're not extremely huge cricket fans, but the two individuals that they always talk about uh, as the, being their favorites, uh, as a player, their favorite is Irfan Patan, and as an umpire, their favorite happens to be you. So I, I have no idea exactly why these two names put together, but it must have been that early 2000s era. So uh, this really is a treat. Uh, you know, I'm sure that they'll find this episode to be quite as nice. <laughs> so much. Yeah. Okay, so Simon, let's just uh, dive right into the book. Uh, and uh, once again, for our viewers and listeners who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, tell us what the book is about. Well, look, the book's simply uh, a brain dump of ideas and concepts and transferable skills to help me get to the top in a chosen field that just happened to be umpiring. And uh, it came about simply because... Uh, when I left the ICC in 2016, I went to work for Cricket Australia as an umpire selection um, and match referees manager. So I looked after selecting umpires. I looked after managing the match referees and the whole assessment within our officiating system here in Australia. In 2018, um, I left Cricket Australia at relatively short notice for various reasons. And I thought, well, what do I do next? And we might talk about coaching later on, but I had a mentor in my in my network uh, who I spoke to about, you know, what do I do next? And he said, look, if you want to undertake corporate training, if you want to do some speaking, if you want to do some, some real make a difference work in this space, it's really important to put a lot of those ideas and concepts and messages into a book form. Yeah. So I took up the challenge of writing a book. And really, for me, I suppose the book is a bit like a business card, to be honest. Um, you know, I didn't write the book with a view to trying to make money or to, to sell lots of books. It's really about communicating messages and allowing people to have a conversation with me through the book. And so I try to share a lot of what worked in my umpiring and business career from a performance perspective. You know, what worked, what didn't work, um, the struggles that I faced, uh, the mountains that I had to climb, my methodology around getting to the top of umpiring and trying to stay there. And so I tried to look at this from a transferable skill point of view and because I didn't think people would necessarily read an umpiring book, but I, I felt that I had a lot to offer about what does it take to get to the top, what does it take to stay there, and how do we keep reaching our potential? So I thought about some cricketing terms and whatever, and I thought finding the gaps was a really good cricketing term about, you know, what's your performance gap? What's the one thing that you might want to attack or take on that might take what you do to the next level? Um, and so there's not a lot of new science in this space, but trying to reach out to people through the lens of cricket and also the love of the game and get them to look at a lot of these performance tips through a different lens. And so that's pretty much why I wrote the book. It took me about maybe four or five weeks to write the book. It took me about four or five months to find a publisher. So finding the publisher was the hardest part. But for me, I love going places where I haven't been before, Omar. I love going to, to do things that I'm doing for the first time. And for me, that 
teaches me more about myself because umpiring teaches you a lot about yourself, a lot of time away from home, a lot of different environments, a lot of different cultures, working with different people. And so you learn to love yourself, you learn to like yourself because you spend a lot of time with yourself on your own. And so when I take on a new project, it takes me to somewhere where I haven't been before and, and that's probably where I get the best out of myself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, kudos to your publisher for believing you and investing <laughs> in you. And you know, we have them to thank. Would you like to give them a shout out? Uh, who were the yeah. publishers? <laughs> ben McMillan, India. Um, ben McMillan, India. Thanks, thanks, yeah. team. <laughs> All right. So, thank you, Pan McMillan, India. You know, anything related to cricket, India is the place to be, and it's the environment that is really very, very um, accommodating of uh, anything related to cricket. Okay, so Simon, um, you know, coming back to the book itself, uh, you know, once again, and let's start with uh, the, the first chapter of the book. Um, as a student of history, you know, I was actually quite uh, pleasantly surprised that you are, you know, albeit it's a really uh, difficult topic to talk about, but I think it's very important that we do touch on it. Um, you started the book with the 20, 2009 uh, terrorist attack that took place in Lahore, Pakistan on the Sri Lankan cricket team uh, convoy. And you were actually part of that convoy. And so my question to you is that, uh, uh, why did you decide to lead with this particular story for a book that was, you know, in, with all, for, all, for all intents and purposes, a self-help book? So would you- Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Thanks for asking it, because uh, I think I wanted to communicate, number one, it's a very um, important story. Um, you know, when people die in your vehicle and you go through a tragic event like that, um, I think there are lessons to be learned. I think there are stories to be told. And I think it's really important that we share those uh, in a way that people can connect with. I also wanted to share that story because um, umpires are human too. We're people too. Sometimes people criticise us. They criticise match officials in all sorts of different sports. And they forget that the match officials are out there just to have a good game themselves. They're out there to enjoy themselves and do what they love. And and no one goes out uh, with the intention of ruining a game of sport in any in any field. So I really wanted people to connect with the fact that, well, um, there were three teams uh, affected on that day. And the umpiring team, just like the Sri Lankan team, were in the thick of it. And we suffered and we hurt. Um, and... Uh, that story I thought needed to be told. And, and I also thought there was a really important lesson that came out of that event. And, and I tell a story in that book, and I'm not going to share that story with you here because I hope that people read that chapter for the particular learning. But even through yeah. the tragedy of that event and the outcome and the death and the injuries and the life-changing moments that occurred, uh, I felt that personally I was even able still to turn that break down into a breakthrough. Yeah. That that even through all of that heartache and through the difficulty, as a team, as an umpiring team, Steve Davis, Peter Manuel, Asan Raza, Nadim Gary, Chris Broad, we all came together and we were a stronger unit and we were stronger individuals having gone through that tragedy. Um, and I would love people to connect with the the humanness of who we are and what we do and to realise that um, we're all the same, you know, and if I can get through that, if some of my colleagues can get through something like that, then they can do. Um, and that doesn't make it trying to glorify the incident or whatever because it was a sad day for cricket. You know, as I said, our, our driver was, was shot and killed in that vehicle in, in that, uh, that, that time. Uh, someone who was just doing his job, you know, just going to a cricket match. And at the end of the day, it's just a game. And I think sometimes people take sport, they take cricket to a level where it's more than a game mm. and it's not, you know. Uh, I used to walk off a cricket field after having a really tough day and, and I'd laughingly say to my colleague, Gee, that was tough, but at least no one died today. 2009, 3rd of March changed that. And and that was really sad for us because all we wanted to do was just go to a cricket match and umpire day three of a test, you know. And, yeah, so that, that's the reason I started with that chapter. And I hope that people really make that connection around humanity mm -hmm. and and the umpires and, and referees, we're people too. And, um, but... 
but something good did come out of that. I learned some really good stuff um, as a result. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's uh, really well said, Simon. You know, as I said that, you know, I think that was also one of my favorite parts of the book. You know, you know, even though it was such a tragic story, and you had to live through that whole thing, and of course, our hearts go out to all the people who lost their lives and uh, and this, you know, unspeakable tragedy. And I do hope that uh, this small trailer for the book uh, will inspire a lot of people to pick it up and uh, uh, read through it and go through that. Uh, well, I can just yeah. finish on that, that question too, Omar. I mean, you look at Asan Raza, who was shot twice, right. um, sitting next to me uh, in that bus, mm -hmm. um, you know, recently in the last couple of weeks, actually being elevated to the ICC elite panel of umpires. Mm -hmm. You know, so here's a guy that's that's come through the operations, that's come through the terrible event, mm -hmm. and has now really uh, realised his goal of, of, of reaching the pinnacle of, of officiating uh, in world cricket. Um, mm -hmm. So again, his personal story and his way to, to come through those types of events and to persevere, yeah. you know, credit to him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're extremely good to hear that he has uh, come through and, and got mm -hmm. it even stronger because of that. So, uh, Simon, just staying with uh, Pakistan itself, you know, uh, uh, they have been sort of like a pariah in the creating world since that uh, 2009 attack. Uh, but uh, if I may ask, have you been back to Pakistan at all since the attack? And uh, do you feel that, you know, uh, they should still be sort of punished for what has happened? Or do you think that, you know, they shouldn't mix up the politics and the cricket together? And should cricket return to Pakistan at all? Do you have an opinion on that? Or, or what is your take on that? You know, if you could just take us through that. The first thing I'd, I'd make comment on would be, uh, I never think the politics and sport should mix. Right. You know, sport is something that unites people, that brings us together, um, that transcends uh, politics and race and religion and all those sorts of things. And, you know, when I, when I did the uh, India-Pakistan semi-final in, uh, in Mahali and the two prime ministers are there in the 2011 Cricket World Cup and to see the two nations come together and, and I've been to the Waikato border um, prior to that, and I've seen the flag raising ceremony for those people who are lucky to see it. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and so I really do believe that there's so much that can be achieved by keeping politics and sports separate. And it's, and for me, you know, th that's where it sits. Um, yes, I have been back to Pakistan um, following that incident just a few years ago, probably two or three years ago now, I reckon. Um, I was invited by uh, a doctor, Dr. Kashif Ansari, who is doing some important uh, medical work and charity work uh, in Karachi. And I went there with Kirtley Ambrose and we sort of championed the cause around donating blood and the importance of, you know, dealing with some social issues. And I must say that, you know, look, I've had many fond memories and many good friendships that have come out of Pakistan as well. It's just that I don't want to define my experience of Pakistan by one day, one incident um, at the hands of a few people. So, uh, yes, I have been back. I felt very safe. Um, I'm not sure I like the term punish um, uh, for what happened on that day, but but I, I really do think that as I, if we get back to the purity of sport and what cricket can do in in in, in our lives, as like I said when I was growing up, it became my second family. Mm -hmm. You know, so it brings people together, and there's so much to celebrate. And I'd love to see, you know, the global game continue to grow and involve as many countries as possible. And I'm all for as many countries playing in a World Cup, you know, because we want to aspire, we want to challenge ourselves and we want to uh, expand the game and give people the benefit of cricket and what it brings to us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, well that's uh, really well said, Simon. And I think that a lot of our viewers and listeners who are watching or listening to this from Pakistan, uh, cricket fans in general, will be very heartened by your endorsement of the resumption of you know uh, cricket in Pakistan and uh, and the fact that they have your support. Okay, so uh, Simon, moving on to something a little more lighthearted. You know, uh, you know that our show is based out of Dhaka after all. So I have to ask you this particular question for our viewers and listeners based in Bangladesh. Uh, can you uh, tell us about you know some of the matches that you've involved in with Bangladesh or within Bangladeshi territory? You know, do walk us through that if there's anything at all that. Share about that. Yeah, look, I've been to Dhaka and, and I've done some one day cricket. I've done an ODI series in Dhaka. And, and the memories and the things that's really stick in my mind uh, one is the passion of the of the fans mm -hmm. and, and the intensity and the enthusiasm of the players. 
I, I don't think that there's a country that appeals more in terms of, you know, the players, the bowlers, they just appeal for everything, mm. you know, so that everything's out when, when they're bowling. And um, they play the game with such enthusiasm and passion that's almost unrivaled, you know, and, and they express it in such an outward way. Um, the, the population and the intensity of the domestic scene mm. it also left a, an impression on me, as much as the impression of the policemen who built the buses with their big sticks to get them moving. You know, so the buses that look like the outside of a golf ball, yeah. you know, the buses that have got so many dints on them, you know, trying to move the traffic along and to, mm. and to get the traffic flowing. Um, but I I remember umpiring Bangladesh with a, a, a fondness of, you know, intensity and passion and, and to expect that every ball that I was officiating when they were bowling was going to be an appeal and that every time there was a Bangladesh um, batsman down the other end um, and there was an appeal, it definitely wasn't out as well. So, you know, um, that, that comes with the territory. But th that's what's great about umpiring around the world is that every country is a little bit different, brings something unique and diverse to the table. And uh, I walk away from, from Bangladesh with great, great memories. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I can tell you for sure that you do have a lot of fans here in uh, Dhaka as well as Shirawang said so anywhere that uh, you you get cricket fans within Bangladesh of course they will all know who you are and, and have very fond memories of you now uh, Simon uh, you know speaking of which um, uh, let's talk a little bit about umpiring partnerships you know uh, when I was growing up watching cricket in the early late 90s and whatnot um, the two the two uh, umpires that always came to mind was David Shepard and Steve Buckner you know, just like mm -hmm. you have the bowling combo of Wasim and Wakar, Greenwich and Haynes, Lily and Thompson, etc. So you have these, you know, bowling and batting partnerships. And with regards to umpiring partnerships, it was always Steve Buckner and David Shepard for me. So who would you uh, consider your better half, uh, you know, figuratively speaking, as an umpire with whom you've had the best um, umpire partnerships? I wonder if my wife is going to think about this. Um, probably from an umpiring perspective, uh, if I was doing a lot Lots of uh, ICC finals. Rudy Kutzen would come to mind. Mm. I, I did quite a few Champions Trophy finals and World Cup finals, uh, semis and playoffs with Rudy. Uh, also, Alim Dar. So I reckon between Rudy and Alim Dar would be probably uh, when it came to ICC finals and you know or IPL finals, for example. I probably reckon I might have done three or four with Rudy as well as IPL finals. Uh, unfortunately, Rudy's no longer with us. Uh, great man, very tough man. Uh, very strong, you know, but also had a really soft side to him as well and had a, an ability to make very good working relationships with the players. Uh, Alim, we know, great decision maker, um, you know, very good in the way that he goes about his job and, again, just a, a quiet achiever in that space. So I think probably Rudy and Alim would be mm. my, my, my partners in crime in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's amazing. So Alim Dar and Rudy Kurtzen, so we'll, we'll definitely keep these two in mind. <laughs> Flip a coin for that. <laughs> yeah, Flip a coin for that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's well said. Okay, so uh, Simon, um, you know, with regards to David Shepard, you know, I think one of the uh, enduring scenes with regards to him, at least for me as a fan, was his idiosyncrasies and his superstitions whenever you would have uh, Nelson, double Nelson, triple Nelson, you know, you'd be hop, skip and jumping around. And uh, and in the book as well, uh, on that fateful day during the attack, you know, you did mention something about umpiring and superstition and the fact that you you would have sat in that same seat, but for some reason you didn't. And so how would you describe yourself? Uh, are you a superstitious man or do you feel that this is just routine and that these are two uh, sides of the same coin? So how would you look at it? Yeah. No, no, I'd say, look, there are things, there are habits and routines that I do that make me feel comfortable. Um, some people might call that a routine. Some people might call that a habit. Some people might call that a superstition. I know that when I played cricket, I'd always put my left pad on first. Um, and some days it worked and some days it didn't. But it's, it's amazing what we do as human beings. We love routine and we tend to do things all the same way. Um, you mentioned David Shepherd, a uh, great man, great character. And what I learned from David really was after doing that India-Pakistan series in 04 in Pakistan, was his ability to build relationships with just about anyone, regardless of where they came from. And I learned from him that to be a good umpire, I really had to look at being a good person. You know, it was about character. It wasn't about cover drives. It wasn't about talent. It was about character. 
And I've really tried to follow on that legacy from, from Shep. And one of my routines, for example, every day, every day from that sort of that series onwards, and I'd walk out on the field, I'd look to the sky and I'd thank three people for being there as an umpire. Mm -hmm. One of them was David Shepard. One of them was Alan Marshall, uh, New South Wales uh, umpire educator and umpire. And the other one was Ted Wikes, who was also from New South Wales as a test umpire. I think those three people have had the largest influence on my career. Mm -hmm. And I look up every day that I walk out and I say thank you and, and please, you know, stand on my shoulder and make sure that the edges are loud ones. So for me, routines are important. Superstitions, yeah, look, they probably make you feel comfortable. But I think, you know, if you're able to prepare strongly to the point where you feel confident and comfortable that you're ready to do what you're about to do, that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, maybe this is where the superstition comes in. We all need a bit of luck. <laughs> you know, we all need that. We all need that pad. Oh, did, did he hit it? Did he not hit it? Fall short. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes you get all the harder pills from your end and sometimes you don't. So, you know, we all need a bit of luck from time to time. And that's probably where the superstition comes in. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, well that's uh, well said. So, yeah, I, I do want to believe that it's probably just, uh, you know, semantics and it's pretty much the same thing. And as you said, you know, two sides of the same coin. But uh, we'll leave it at that. Now, uh, you know, going from uh, David Shepard, uh, you know, Simon, let's uh, talk about another very renowned uh, umpire, uh, Harold Dickey Bird, you know, the, the really jovial English umpire who's, who's uh, still with us today and who retired a long time back. But I can recall a story, uh, you know, between him and Jeffrey Boycott, where uh, Dickey was sort of lamenting the fact that, oh, you know, technology is taking over everything. And you know, Jeffrey Boycott was having a laugh about that, saying that, oh, Dickie's, of course, going to be sad about that because it's his job that's on the line. And I think with regards to uh, the contemporary atmosphere the world over, you know, there is this innate fear of AI taking over everything. And so for Dickie, you know, the, th the, the technology uh, that was trying to help uh, the umpires at the time that was just new and coming in, that was his version of the AI. But how would you look at it? Do you feel that technology has been uh, good for the game? It has definitely been good for the game, but has it been good for you know an umpire or the skill levels of an umpire? Uh, how would you uh, look at that? How much time have you got, Omar? <laughs> <laughs> You've got plenty of time, Simon, so please go ahead. Technology is always a fascinating topic and I always get asked about it. Uh, my view about technology in sport and in cricket in particular is that, uh, first of all, Technology these days shows how many correct decisions the umpires do make. Right. You know, you're up against a 31 cameras, uh, ball tracker, you know, ultra edge, super slow-mo, all the sorts of bells and whistles, plus you've got the three experts in the commentary position to tell everyone at home what the answer should have been, what the decision should have been. You know, we get less than 0.4 of a second um, to make a decision, see all the evidence from one angle, let alone 31 angles potentially uh, at an international match that's got full coverage. But yet the umpires still have an average correct decision percentage of around about 92, 93%. Mm. And if you said to the average person, coach, player, you know, man, woman in the street, would you be happy if we got, we got nine out of 10 right today? And they'd all say, yeah. Mm. But of course, it's the one out of 10. It's it's the decision on the on the Bangladesh captain that people get upset about and I, I can understand and sympathise with that because as umpires, we want to get it all right. So my view is about technology supporting umpiring decisions and I'm really sorry to see at the moment, just only this week, where the ICC Cricket Committee have recommended to remove the soft signal mm -hmm. from on-field umpires to the third umpire for things like um, fair catches and, um, you know, those sorts of decisions because I think umpiring is about making decisions and what we do know about technologies is not always right you know that the camera may not pick up something or there's an angle that's obscured or we just don't have that replay or there's there is a problem with ball tracker and so if we don't have umpires making decisions well technology doesn't always give us the answer how many times have you had to reboot your mobile phone how many times have you had to reboot your laptop how many times has part of your AI in various household equipment not worked? 
you know, and you've had to either replace it, call a technician or restart it. You know, so technology is not foolproof either. And so what I am conscious about too is that technology in the umpiring space can breed mediocrity or laziness, you know. So for me, it's about let's get it right in the first place. Let's do everything we can to be able to make the decision or get it right on field and not necessarily just say, well, look, we're only getting it right 93% of the time, so let's just go down the all-technology route. Um, I think that's a really dangerous place to be. And, I, you know, for me, working my way through the umpiring system over, you know, 10 to 12 to 15 years to get to the top, I built those skills, I built that knowledge, I built that ability to then have it de-skilled when you reach the top level. Mm. Yeah, that's a bit disappointing. And in my career, from a test perspective, I only did three tests with Australia, who were the number one team in the world at the time. Mm. I wanted to umpire Australia a lot more at that test level because they were the best team and I wanted to test my skills and my abilities against the best. Mm. You know, so I think that's part of the, the beauty of sport. And that's part of the attraction and, and the role of sport is to challenge yourself and to and to be tested and to, to face adversity and to find a way to, to achieve really good outcomes. So um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of just all the time an umpire going upstairs to the third umpire and going, not my problem, over to you, yeah. and you make the decision. Uh, I really want to see those decision-making skills maintained as much as we can. But, of course, we need to get as many decisions right as possible. So technology can mask, the use of technology can mask probably some of the skill elements or some of the skill failures or improvements that could be made because, oh, well, the outcome generates the process or it justifies the process. So as long as we get the decision right, we don't care how we get there. I'm not, I'm not sold on that. I still think, you know, there is a real need for the game to have that human element. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to um, agree or lower the standards to, to allowing errors to, to be maintained. Mm -hmm. But what are we doing? What are we doing to get the decision right in the first place? You know, that still should be the primary focus. And I think sometimes in the administrators' minds, through their lens, they think as long as we're getting the decision right and we're not achieving criticism, everything's okay. Mm. So um, the umpiring team, for me, deserves as much support and as much investment to be able to improve what they do right. rather than saying, don't worry, technology will fix it up. Mm. Uh, yeah. So there's the balance. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's really well said. So there needs to be a balance between the two. You need to have the technology, but you also have to have the human element in it. And you know, and not just turn it into a very machine-oriented uh, process, but but definitely have the yeah, exactly right. Because for me, umpiring is an art; it's not a science. Not a science, you right? Know, you know, we're, we're working with people, we're dealing with people, and people have said, "Do you think the more technology improves, we won't need an umpire out on the field?" Well, the answer is, we will need an umpire out on the field. Who manages ground, weather, and light? Who manages fair and unfair play? Right. You know, who manages over rates and the pace of the game? Yeah. So we need we need people out there. We need people to do this type of job and this role. Mm -hmm. And decision making is part of that as well. Mm -hmm. So managing people and managing those sorts of issues is an art. It's not a science. And we've got to be really careful not to talk turn cricket into a science. For sure, for sure. And uh, <clears throat> Simon, if I can get your uh, opinion on uh, a, a, something that came up very recently with regards to uh, penalizing the fielding side, not monetarily, but with regards to having more fielders inside the circle. Uh, that really has probably helped the overrate a, a lot. Uh, so would you say that you're uh, supportive of this decision to-, uh, well, to get what, this what, we, what we do know about, about fines is they don't work. They don't work, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, monetary penalties at the top end of the game that's very commercialized, mm -hmm. fines don't work. Fines do not change behavior. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and so I think we've got to work out ways to actually incentivize and reward um, the behaviors and, and and the desired behaviors that we want. Uh, having an in-match penalty uh, has worked because now there's actually the result on the table. You know, in other competitions I've seen where they deduct um, parts of competition points from a team for every over that they're short. 
that is an incentive to actually make sure that you bowl your overs on time because you want to win the competition. Right. So we know that in-match penalties or in-tournament penalties regarding competition points is a better incentiviser and driver. Yep. Um, what we also know that the fines do not work. Right. And isn't it interesting that at, at some stage we actually started penalising the captain to the point where they were suspended for a match? Mm -hmm. And then when it came around to the final or the playoffs and a captain wasn't available, nobody liked it. Mm -hmm. And this is always the trade-off, you know. So people who want more technology to get more decision right, well, where's the time going to come from? You know, I read stories at the moment that the IPL matches is going more than four hours mm -hmm. because of all the extra delays and stoppages for the use of technology, player reviews for, for decisions and no balls and wides and full tosses and all. The time's got to come from somewhere. So everything that we do in the game has a price to pay. And most of the time, that's time. Mm -hmm. And we just need to be conscious that, you know, uh, we can't have everything, is that everything has a cost, whether it's money or time or both. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's really well said, and especially, you know, what you've alluded to, to the IPL and the T20 format in general. I mean, this was a format that was invented literally to, to you know, slot into a three-hour or three-and-a-half-hour time period. And if technology is gone, if you're going to review everything from wides to no balls, of course, it's yep. going to go over, you know, four hours and there, there has to be an opportunity cost somewhere. So, yes, I think that's really well said. Okay, so, Simon, uh, we will do our due diligence to our viewers and listeners who want to know more about the book, and we will get to that uh, immediately. But just before that, I have one last question, which I really have to ask you as a cricket fan. And uh, I would like you, to, I'd like to walk you through a scenario uh, which I would like to get your opinion on, and that is, uh, suppose that it's the last, very last ball of a ODI. Uh, the batting team is down to its, uh, you know, let's say nine wickets down, and uh, they need two runs to win, and they need one run to tie. So the bowler bowled the ball. The it, it hits the batter on, on the bat. You know, it takes the inside edge, but the umpire and and and, uh, and the batters have started to run. But the umpire inherently gives the batter out LBW which the batters are able to reverse through a, you know, the decision review system. But uh, lo and behold, when the batter is given not out, the run that they attempted to get isn't counted and it's actually entered as a dot ball. And somehow this doesn't seem to, you know, fit right with me. You know, the batters are being penalized one run for, oh, for no mistake of their own. And so how would you look at that? How, how would you, would you keep this uh, as it is or would you make some tweaks to this? Particular. What's the alternative? What's the alternative? The only alternative available is to re-bowl the ball. And some would say that that's unfair on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, and here's the problem of playing the game backwards. And here's the point that I was making earlier on about putting the focus on getting the decision right in the first place right. and not re relying upon technology or the DRS to actually overturn and change the decision mm -hmm. is because that's what sport's about, you know, us doing our best to get it right every ball. But, we, you know, it's very difficult to write playing conditions or laws to play the game backwards. We just don't, that's not the way the game moves forward. We don't do it that way. So like we were talking before about using technology and time, everything has got a price to pay. Everything has got a trade-off. So the trade-off here is the batter gets to stay and they get to remain not out. But you're right, the, the run that they probably might have scored, we don't know the answer to that question, mm -hmm. but they might have, you know, the ball becomes dead at the time the umpire makes their decision. So we're not going to make that ball go from dead to live and then say, well, that run now counts because the fielding side were well and truly titled to say, well, they were given out, so therefore they thought the ball was dead, so the game has changed. Mm -hmm. And so there's no, this is why it's not a science, it's an art. You know, the game the game is just the game. It is a game. Yeah. Um, but w when we try to keep tweaking and we keep writing, the more we have to keep tweaking and writing. So there's no perfection here. No perfection. Okay. Yeah, for sure. No. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's well said, Simon, because, uh, you know, this was always something that I was very uh, contentious about. I didn't know whether it was 
being completely fair or not to the batter, but but you're right. The bowling side didn't do anything wrong either, right? So it's a, trying to make the best of a sticky situation, I suppose, right? So you then went to the other side of it. You said, okay, well, look, in the in the attempt for fairness, what we'll do is we'll re-bowl the ball. Mm-hmm. Well, the bowling side's going to say, hang on, but as you say, well, we didn't do anything wrong. Right, right. Now, we thought we won the game. Mm-hmm. Now we've got to re-bowl the ball, and guess what's going to happen? Murphy's Law would tell you that the batting side's going to score the required runs and they'll lose the game on a re-bowl delivery. Mm-hmm. You know, and then there'll be a counter-argument to that from everyone else. Mm-hmm. So when, when we sit down and we look at laws or playing conditions, we look at the fabric of the game as best we can and we come up with a position that's as best as possible. And there'll always be dissenters. There'll always be an alternative point of view. But the game's not perfect. And, and I just have to finish on that. That's just the way it is. And every side goes into a competition or into a match knowing what the playing conditions are. But when it affects you, of course, no one's happy. For sure, for sure. Well, uh, definitely. Uh, like you said, you know, it's more art than science. And, of course, we'll, we'll definitely leave it at that. And, you know, it's a debate that can go on forever. But uh, I'm convinced after having listened to your Part of the argument that yes it needs to be fair on uh, both sides okay so simon as promised you know let's uh, let me do my due diligence and you know let's divert our attention back to the book and uh, the transferable skills which is the sub- subtitle of the book itself um so one of the things i'd like to touch upon simon is with regards to you know an umpire whenever we think of the, the long hours that an umpire has to stay out in the field you know focus and concentration are of course two things that are extremely important And this is, of course, something that is a transferable skill to any other vocation. But in the book itself, you made a very interesting uh, distinction between focus and concentration. A lot of uh, lay people may think that, okay, they pretty much mean the same thing. But you've made a distinction between the two. Can you tell us a little bit more about your understanding of the difference between uh, focus and concentration? Yeah, sure. Uh, so in very simple terms for me, I, I get asked the question a lot, you know, how can you stand out there and concentrate for six, seven hours a day? And the short answer is you can't. So I don't even try. So what I do is the first thing I try and do is I try and chunk it down. I try to break my day up into bite-sized chunks. What does that look like for me? Well, I just focus on getting through the first ball, then the first over, and then the first hour, and then we have a break. Mm. And then after that drinks break, it's then again back to getting through the first ball, the first over, and then the next hour, and then we have a, a lunch break or a tea break, whatever it happens to be, or, or it's the end of the day. Now, concentration is a, is a wonderful topic, and I think it has a connotation that we're doing the right thing, but I'm not sure we are doing the right thing because even while we've been doing this chat, this interview, people's minds will start to wander. And they'll start to think about, oh, I remember that game or I was, you know, watching at the time or I wonder what he's going to talk about next. So they're concentrating, but they're not concentrating necessarily on what we're talking about right then, right now. Yeah. Their, their minds actually wandered. So they're concentrating on something, but it may not be the right thing. So for me to be an effective cricket umpire and to do a really good job, I have to focus on the right things at the right time, the right things at the right time. I find a lot of us disconnect. We're either in the past or in the future, but we've disconnected from the present. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times when I make a mistake, it's because I've been in a different mental space. You know, I've been in the past, I've been thinking about the previous delivery, I think about the previous mistake, or I'm thinking about what the match referee is going to write in the report or what the commentators might be saying, what's, you know, what's the headline for tomorrow morning. I've disconnected from the present and I'm not focusing on the right things at the right time. So when I'm umpiring well, I don't think I just do. I'm on that autopilot. I'm focusing on the play and I'm picking up all the different cues of player reaction, ball movement, did it bloop, did it zoom out, Did I wait for the sound to come to me? It's all about the process. And so for me, if I find that I'm focusing on the right things at the right time Mm -hmm. and not getting sort of mentally hijacked by finding myself in the past or the future, then I'm more than likely going to be doing the right thing. 
not, not no guarantee because there's no guarantees in performance, but I give myself not high performance but high percentage. Mm. I give myself the best opportunity of making the best decision I can because my eyes and ears are in the middle of this cricket ground at the right time mm. looking at all the evidence, right. not thinking about the last decision, not thinking about tomorrow's headline, but in the here and now. Mm. So I'm in the zone. So if I focus on the right things at the right time, high percentage. If I'm concentrating, that doesn't guarantee me that I'm actually concentrating on the right stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really want people to think about the distinction. And yes, it might be mute. It might be a little bit, you know, a bit of a tweak. But if I can get that message across to people in what they do, so whether that's in an office job, whether it's in an outdoor job, they're obviously very good at what they do because they've got the job. Yeah. But the best results will come when they remain connected with the moment and they focus on the right cues so that they can then do the right thing. Mm -hmm. They give themselves high percentage possibility of outcomes. Does that sort of make sense, Omar? Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. And I think what you said is uh, really, you know, it's really well said in the sense that uh, you're talking about grounding yourself in the present, not trying to live in the past or the future. So it's the here and now that's important. And the only thing, you know, from non Pines perspective that really matters is the next delivery and the passage of plane. So I, I really like that, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I would never have imagined what the mach mach machinations were uh, if not for the book. So I really do appreciate uh, uh, being able to be privy to your thoughts and be able to pick your brain with regards to everything that you've written here. And so just staying with the uh, focus and concentration, Simon, you know, I just wanted to get your opinion very quickly on something else that uh, with regards to some batters, you know, uh, let's exclude the great ones because, you know, they're on a different plane altogether. But what happens to uh, a lot of batters after they reach their milestone, especially the century and they take off their helmet, they're raising their bat. And very soon after that, we tend to see them, you know, getting out. So would you say that there, that lapse in concentration is happening for some reason or, uh, you know, what would be your take on why we tend to see this happening on a consistent basis with the players whom we wouldn't classify as? Uh, great, you know, with the mid-level players. That's a good question. And, and it's a high-risk moment for umpires too, coming back from a drinks break or a lunch break or a tea break, is because it, it's a moment where there's a break in routine. Right. There's a break in momentum. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost a matter of starting again. And so I don't think necessarily it might be a, a focus issue so much, but it's a break in the routine. Mm -hmm. And again, there's there's... Um, there's a really strong need to actually not get complacent. Yeah. So just because we're, we're travelling along okay and we've had a stoppage doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue that way. So one of the things that I've learned through my career is just because we're following a routine doesn't guarantee that we're going to get the outcomes we want because unless we execute with purpose, unless we actually do and focus on the right things at the right time with purpose mm -hmm. and actually stay in that moment, stay in that present. Mm -hmm. Unless we do that, that complacency will lead to bad stuff from happening. And in an umpiring world, that means you miss something or you make a mistake or as a batter, all of a sudden you're playing a shot that you wouldn't have played prior to the break. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really important. And I think this sort of goes to your question around is it focus, is it concentration? To me, it's it's a bit more than that because it's about the, the routines that have been broken and you've got to get back into those routines with effort and focus. Yeah. And it's also about applying yourself mm -hmm. and not just relying upon that it's going to continue, right. okay? But you're all, because the situation's now changed. Mm -hmm. You know, you've now got the bowling team and the bowling captain's probably been re-energised, refocused with a change of plan, a change of tactic or they're just going to try something different. And if you don't adapt to that extra energy and with that different plan, then, of course, you're going to be possibly found wanting. Mm -hmm. So it's a high-risk time for a lot of people. Absolutely. So we do need to go back to, you know what, I've got to start again. Mm -hmm. And I can't take that, that momentum for granted. I can't take those routines for granted. I really now have to go back to my processes Right. and actually execute with purpose, you know, and, and and really stay in the moment now because it's a high-risk time. 
I was very lucky enough early in my career at the Umpires Association in New South Wales, we had a guest speaker come in by the name of Ian Healy. Mm -hmm. Now, Ian Healy, great wicketkeeper for Australia. Ian's job as a wicketkeeper is very similar to an umpire. We're in the game every ball. Mm -hmm. So it's about developing those routines and habits, working really hard. So Ian's message to us was, work your butt off for the first 10 or 15 minutes of the session. Get the, get the feet moving, get the eyes moving, get the routines going, work really hard. And then once they're set, then sort of back off a bit. So if you can imagine an aircraft that's going full thrust at takeoff, right. you know, so the pilot goes all the way full thrust, maximum power to take off. And then when we get to a certain level of altitude, we're going to pull back on the throttle and level off and cruise. And cruise, yeah. yeah absolutely. And I think that's what we need to do every time we start a new session is we've got to work really hard for that first 10 or 15 minutes, yeah. get our feet moving, get our eyes moving, get our ears going get those habits and routines really set, focus on the right things at the right time. Then we can pull back a little bit on the throttle right. and sort of just manage through the rest of the session because right. we can't maintain that intensity the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, and kudos to Ian Healy for, you know, uh, for that interaction with you. And of course, you do allude to it in the book. And speaking of altitude, uh, Simon, you know, that brings me to another chapter in the book, which is actually one of my favorites. And, you know, as cliched as it may sound, you know, attitude determines your altitude. Uh, you know, it is really true. And I, as I like to tell a lot of uh, viewers and listeners, you know, I moonlight as a podcaster and YouTuber, but in my day job, I'm a full-time sales director. And I'm always yep. looking for, you know, new sales managers to recruit them. And the first thing that I always uh, tell my HR people to look for is a person's attitude, right? Because at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, your skill set may or may not be up to the mark for the job description at hand, but if you have a lousy attitude, you know, you're not going to get very far and it's going to create a terrible environment for the rest of the office, right? So uh, I, I do, uh, you know, con concur with you with regards to attitude, uh, determining your altitude. But for our viewers and listeners who haven't read that chapter of the book, uh, would you mind telling us uh, a bit more about, you know, how attitude determines your altitude? Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you for the opportunity on this one. For me, attitude's everything. Um, and even when I sat down, I think it was around 2013, in helping design the assessment system for the ICC Elite Panel, and even in my work with Cricket Australia around uh, selecting umpires, attitude and teamwork are number one together as a as a combination. You can do almost anything with attitude and teamwork. Um, and I was only doing some reading this morning uh, where I came across a quote that basically said that talent is the floor and character is the ceiling. So, you know, talent, skills, abilities will get you the job interview. They will open the door. Mm -hmm. right. But it's attitude and character and your ability to work in a team environment. Those things will actually determine your potential. They will take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. And... That's what you really need to sell. So if you're going for a job interview, you've probably got the job interview because you've got the CV, you've got the qualifications, you've got the ability and the capabilities. But it's the other soft skills of attitude and um, some of the things I'm about to mention that will actually see you achieve great things if yeah. you do get the job. Yeah. And, and I prefer to, to select based on character and attitude. Yeah. So what things am I looking for? I'm looking for humility. I'm looking for people who have the attitude that they don't know everything and that there is room for improvement and there are things to learn. So if I if I looked at um, a continuum, at this end we've got humility and at that end we've got ego. If you've got someone walking in the door with massive ego that says, I know everything, I know what to do, you can't tell me what to do, yeah. you're going to struggle yeah. and they're going to struggle. Yeah. Because when, when stuff happens and stuff will happen and bad stuff will happen, they're going to block. They're going to say, no, no, I know the way. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You must do it my way. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a blocker to getting better. If there's humility, massive amounts of humility, well, how could we do it better? Mm -hmm. Oh, you've got a good idea. What is that idea? You know, so inclusivity and diversity actually can grow in that environment where you've got massive ego and a blockage. Inclusivity and diversity will not work because it's about one person where you've got much greater 
ability for team success when you've got massive humility. So that's number one for me in terms of attitude. Um, two, I'm looking for attitude where people are going to stretch themselves, that they're going to try new things, that they're going to have a go. You know, so in a, in a very simplistic way, uh, most of the parents in the room might might connect with this, but you put some something on the table for your young children mm-hmm. and the first thing they say is, no, I don't like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, but you haven't even tried it. You might like it. No, I don't like the look of that. That's the wrong colour. I don't like that. How do you know? And then years down the track, they say, oh, I now no, love that. Yeah. Well, I gave it to you years ago and you said no. Oh, but it's now my favourite. You know, so... I don't mind people trying and 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 stretching themselves and then working out that wasn't for them and they didn't like it. That's okay. I can deal with that. But to simply put a blockage and say no without even trying, yeah. that's that's the wrong attitude. Exactly. You know. So what can I do? How can I help? And normally the right attitude can start with a question. You know. So attitudes about let's find a way. What can we do better? Um, in terms of, and this was personified when I had a very good discussion with Gary Kirsten around what was his coaching philosophy, what was his coaching attitude, how did he work out a way of, of getting better? And he said, mate, when we get our team together every day, we ask ourselves two questions. Are we doing this the right way? Mm-hmm. And is there a better way? Mm-hmm. That's what I call a great attitude. Mm-hmm. You know, let's try. Let's find a way. Let's get more ideas on the table. Let's stretch ourselves. But the, the other one that I'll talk about on, on attitude would be taking responsibility for what's not working. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for that to occur, you've got to have super amounts of honesty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid to be honest. A lot of people are afraid to take ownership for what doesn't work or for their mistakes. Mm-hmm. So you must have an attitude of honesty and taking responsibility for what's not working because mm-hmm. connected with that is accountability. Right. So as a cricket umpire, I'm accountable for my game. I own all of my mistakes. Everyone can see them. But I also have to be honest to myself about my effort and my application and how I went about my my task today. And sometimes that's the only, I'm the only one that knows that. So attitude is really central about exploring areas of potential and having a go and trying new things. But you can only do that when you are super humble and not massively ego. You do need to have a bit of ego for confidence. Mm. You know, so that's yeah. that's important. Yeah. But attitude, I hope I've answered that question a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You have, you have. And uh, and I must say, Simon, that you know, I completely concur with everything that you've written in the book about uh, the, the positive aspects of attitude, and this really should be the defining factor never recruiting new people, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, and you alluded to Gary Kirsten and coaching. And speaking of which, I have to say that another chapter in the book that you uh, spoke about is coachability or you know, getting a coach. And you also mm-hmm. name dropped uh, Brad Gilbert and his book, Winning Ugly. And, you know, it mm-hmm. kind of inspired me to pick up the book as well. Uh, I, you know, granted, I haven't finished reading it yet, but I can tell that it's going to be an excellent read. But uh, do tell us about uh, your coaching, you know, your philosophy about getting a coach, getting a mentor, and how exactly that helped you in your career, Simon, and how, uh, why yeah, you're yeah, such yeah. a pro- proponent of, you know, getting a coach. So walk us through yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Daryl here introduced me to a, um, a gentleman by the name of Russell Trotter early on in my career. Mm-hmm. And uh, Russell Trotter at that stage was the referees manager for the Australian Rugby Union mm-hmm. sport. Right. Now, Russell um, ended up leaving that role within a year or two after me meeting him, and he took on a job around life coaching. Mm-hmm. And he sort of got me thinking about, and we connected, we, we obviously formed a relationship. And I very quickly worked out, and, and I was lucky enough in the Australian cricket system where I saw players had coaches, but umpires did not. Right. How does that work? So, again, related to attitude, relating to performance development, continuous improvement and trying new things, um, I started doing some work with Russell. Now, Russell was also a former Test Rugby Union referee, so he got officiating. He knew officiating. And long story short, at the height of my career, I probably had five coaches that I had 
I had an umpire coach, I had a life coach, I had a finance coach, I had a fitness coach, mm. and I also had a nutritionist. Right. Some of which were resources from Cricket Australia, some of which I went and found myself. Um, I believe as a result of all the work that I've done and the experiences that I've had is that everybody needs to have a coach. Not, probably not as many as I had, but everyone needs a coach and everybody needs a mentor. Why? Um, for me, a coach does two things primarily. They support you when times are tough and they give you a kick up the bum when you get too far ahead of yourself. Yeah. But from a coaching philosophy, I believe that the person who drives the relationship should be the individual, not the coach. And I also think the role of the coach is to ask really good questions. If you've got a coach that's telling you what to do all the time, that's not coaching. That might be training, but it's not coaching. Because for me, coaches, a bit like what I was telling you about Gary Kirsten before, coaches need to empower people to be self-sufficient. Think for themselves, right. You know, and, and to, to draw out from you the answers to your own problems. Because it's a bit like what Gary said to me. He said, when the players cross that white line, that boundary, I can't help them. They're on their own. They've got to make their own decisions. Sure, we can unpack it later and do whatever. But at the time, they're in charge and they, they, they're making those decisions. So it's a bit like for me, again, when I cross that white road, my coaches can't help me. I'm on my own. I can't sort of radio up to the coach and say, you know, what do you think? Uh, what should I do now? Yeah. You know? That's not going to happen. So coaches should ask you good questions and help you self-discover the solutions that you're looking for. Great. The other thing that they should do is not necessarily try to be experts on everything. So for me, a good coach is a bit like a general practitioner. So you go to your doctor. Your doctor doesn't necessarily know what the problem is, but they might refer you to a specialist, Great. you know, to get some tests done and to actually talk to a specialist on your particular issue. So for me, Russell did that particularly well with me where he might send me off to another mate of his and say, look, I, I, I've got someone in my network that's really good with eyes, really good with eyesight and, and, and improving that area or really good with communication and really good with managing conflict. Go and have a chat with them. Right. So, you know, your coach won't be all things to all people. Yeah. And, and I think what they will do, as I said before, they will push you outside of your comfort zone by asking you challenging questions, which will either be in a supportive way or, you know what, um, and Russell did this with me a lot. He said, mate, I want you to keep training like you're number two. Yeah. Above all, don't get complacent in your training. Keep putting the effort in and keep training like you're number two because there's always room for improvement. You never know how good you can be until you try. Yeah. And, and so they add that extra layer of accountability into the whole development process. Um, so sometimes, for example, and, and here's maybe a, an example that some of your listeners might respond to. So I'm going to the gym now three days a week, 5.30 a.m. start. Now, for some people, getting up at 5.30 for, or 5 o'clock for a 5.30 session is bloody tough. Mm. You know, it's really tough getting out of bed in the morning that early for some people. But what I do, my mate and I is three or four doors down. We go to the same class. And we take it in turns to drive each other. Mm. Now, sometimes if I find it tough to get out of the morning, I'm not getting out of bed in the morning for me. I'm getting out of the bed in the building in the morning for him. For him. Right. Exactly. You know, because um, if I'm accountable to another person, sometimes that makes up for my lack of motivation that morning. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a coaching relationship that really is working, sometimes that motivation might be just on the downside for you. But if you then are responsible and accountable to a coach, that might just help you drive that a little bit further. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, I think that's really well said, Simon. And uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, getting a coach and and every time I think of coaches and mentors, you know, you did talk about Gary Kirsten, but for me, um, you know, the late Shane Warren and the late Terry Jenner and the partnership that they had with each other, uh, especially in the beginning of Shane Warren's career when he had a pretty, you know, not so good debut, you could say, where he was carted around for 150 odd runs and Ravi Shastri had scored a double century in that match. Right after that, you know, he got in touch with Terry Jenner. And so they worked hand in glove together. And and like yep. you said, you know, uh, there's one more thing that you mentioned, which I, which really 
takes me back to when when I was working uh, in a telecommunications company here in Dhaka called Roby Exiata. My boss always told me that Omar never come to me with a problem unless you've also thought about a solution. So that's right. exactly you know what you've just said uh, in the book as well as uh, to mm. I ask good questions. Absolutely, yeah. ask good questions. Exactly. All right. So on that note, Simon, I have to say that uh, I've pretty much exhausted all of my questions for the show. But uh, before we let you go, I would like to take you through a couple of uh, guest questions that I've had uh, uh, before we started the episode. I solicited these uh, guest questions from others who were on the show before. And so the first, uh, with your permission, you know, I'd like to just uh, you know, tell you a couple of those uh, guest questions. Um, so the first go up to the third umpire if I get stuck. No. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Go up to the third umpire. If he gets if you, for sure, no, no, no worries. You could definitely do that. But uh, but uh, but the first guest question that we have, uh, Simon, is from uh, Mr. Gideon Haig, the great uh, Gideon Haig. Hey, Gideon. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Gideon is also a friend of the show, and he was here uh, just a couple of episodes back, and he made it a point to mention uh, to tell you to give him your give you his regards, and he called you a good chap. So <laughs> so. so. I'm happy to have had uh, this question from Gideon. Okay, so Gideon obviously um, is the co-author of the book um, Sultan a Memoir. You know, he co-wrote the book with uh, the great Wasim Akram, and the book came out very recently. And so the question from Gideon to you, Simon, is: um, Dear Simon, my pet peeve uh, is the amount of time wasted by substitutes running gloves, drinks, etc., on and off the field. It is completely unregulated in a game that already has sufficient naturally occurring lulls. Would you be in favor of the boundaries being closed except for medical treatment or the umpires being empowered to penalize teams for time wasting? Uh, what would be your take on that? So yeah, the question from Gideon Haig. Uh, yeah, so it's a good question because it involves something called behavior bracket creep. Um, so what happens, of course, is that as soon as someone runs on some gloves and no one does anything, uh, that's okay. And then they run gloves on two more times and no one does anything and that's okay. And then they bring on drinks and no one does anything and that's okay. And so all of a sudden we've got multiple interruptions. And then someone says like Gideon, well, how did we get here? Um, this goes back to, I think, the subject around safety and health. So for example, if somebody wants a drink and we deny someone a drink and then they develop um, heat exhaustion or suffer a medical response as a result of not being hydrated correctly, where does that leave us? Where does that leave the game? And so I think there's an issue with drinks that probably could be taken off to the side here a little bit. But the way that we try to manage bat changes and glove changes these days is we say to the two teams that there will be no changes of gloves and no changes of bat within 10 minutes of a drinks break unless there's a breakage unless the piece of equipment actually breaks. You've got this behaviour bracket creep. So someone like, for example, you know, Steve Smith might go through 14 pairs of gloves on the one day, right. you know, if, you, if he bats long enough. And here's the problem where you try to maintain good relationships with the players and you try to find a way to keep the game moving as best you can. So Steve Smith comes to you and says, I want to change my gloves. And you say, sorry, mate, you can't change your gloves. There's nothing wrong with them. And then two balls later, he gets out. And so then he blames us. You know, and so that leaves us with really nowhere to go. So this is where we turn to the administrators and you say, you know what, we'll do anything you want, providing you support us. You know, so if we say no to glove changes and then something bad happens as a result of that, are you going to back the player or back the team or are you going to back us? Which one is it? And, and so this is where umpires are left in a very precarious position around do we or don't we? Um, you know, because technically players still are not allowed to go off for a toilet break and have a substitute. They can go off to the toilet, mm. but they can't have a sub. Wow. That's incredible. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, you want to tell Wazi Macram, you want to tell Glenn McGrath, yeah, you can go, but you can't have a sub. Mm -hmm. You know, what does that look like and what does that do for player-umpire relationships? So we manage that the best way we can. And we say Glenn McGrath's going off for some strapping. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's going off for some medical attention and he just so happens he's going to the bathroom at the same time. <laughs> All right. So we find ways to manage those sorts of situations. Mm -hmm. But 
it's a bit like what happened with with runners and and, and injured strikers and runners. You know, so if you've got a provision there where they can have runners and they're not running really well or they're getting tired, well, people will take advantage of that of that rule. Now what the game said is there's no runners in international cricket. So the, the challenge here is finding middle ground, and there probably is no middle ground. So if you if you if Gideon's upset about glove changes, bat changes, extra drinks, then you've got to say no to all of them. And they've got to be the same for both teams. Um, regardless of the circumstance, yeah. because otherwise, what is the middle ground? What does it look like? For sure, for sure. Yeah, and then that's also, you know, it's a really highly contentious and debatable issue, and it's sort of like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. So that's kind of, I can completely sympathize with the situation of the, that the umpires have to face. I'm not exactly sure what Gideon had in mind when he sent in the question, but it's funny that you should mention Ricky Ponting in your answer. And of course, that of course takes me back to the 2009 Ashes, and G uh, Jimmy Anderson was there, and there was so many glove changes, and Ponting was just losing his cool. And so uh, I, I don't think you were in that match, though, right, Simon? But but uh, I wasn't. I don't know, and because I can't umpire Australia England matches uh, oh, in Ashes. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, here's the problem with substitute fielders, you know. So for me, if the batting side are not allowed a substitute runner. Yeah. What does the fielding team get allowed as substitute fielder? A very good question, yeah. You know, so if we're talking about maintaining the balance between bat and ball and how we treat substitutes and injuries, mm -hmm. one yeah. side can have a substitute, mm -hmm. the other side can't. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so there's pluses and minuses for all of that. Yeah, for the sure. game's not perfect. It's yeah, a for sure. As you said, the game's not perfect and, you know, it's still a very debatable issue. Okay, so Simon, very quickly, let me just uh, throw another uh, guest question at you. And the, the second guest question that we have for you comes from uh, Tetenda Taibu, the former Zimbabwean national cricket captain. And Tetenda is also a friend of the show, and he's also the author of the book, uh, Keeper of Faith. And he's also got another book in somewhere in the pipeline, which might be out very soon. And so the question that Tetenda has for you, Simon, is, um, dear Simon, you were the first umpire to get back-to-back -back best umpire awards. How were you able to keep the balance of maintaining high standards and being firm with the players while also being a friendly, likable, and nice person? <laughs> and, uh, but just before you answer that, Simon, you know, I have to tell our viewers and listeners that it wasn't just back to back. You, in fact, won the ICC Umpire uh, of the Year Award five times in a row, the first five inaugural uh, awards from 2008, uh, sorry, 2004 to 2008. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure our viewers and listeners knew that. but. Yeah, please go ahead with your answer to that. Uh, thank you, and hi, to Tender. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's all about process for me. So making sure the processes were working and were achieving the outcomes I was looking for. Um, I never set the goal of achieving um, ICC umpire of the year at all. That was never a goal. Um, it was all about process. And in fact, in that first year that I won that award, I had my worst test match ever. So if you'd asked me three months later, would I stand up in front of a room full of people and accept that award for the first time, the David Shepherd Award, I would have said, you're joking. No way in the world. Um, so it comes down to process. Um, second thing I'd say is it comes down to what I said before about my coach saying to me, like, you keep training like you're number two. So I always focused on the game that was in front of me. I always prepared and trained as thoroughly as I could for the game in front of me because uh, that was the most important game. The third thing I think would be around uh, managing people um, that we spoke about earlier on and the fact that this is an art. So what do I mean by that in this context? Um, it's important to talk to people with empathy and understanding and also listen to what they've got to say. So whenever a captain would raise an issue, the first thing that's important is, is to listen and then to acknowledge and then to understand where they're coming from and to try to find a way to deal with that issue and, and find a good working relationship with all of the captains and all of the senior players because you don't have to like them all, but you have to have a good working relationship with them and treat them with respect. Mm -hmm. You know, I really respected the fact that captaining a country was an incredibly difficult position and role, and hopefully they respected that umpiring was very difficult too. But I think to, to get respect, you have to earn it and you have to give it. Yeah. And you can only do that by 
those things that I talked about, particularly the empathy. And, and, and so your language might be really important here to say, look to tender, I understand that you're facing a really uphill battle with lots of runs being scored against you, but we still need to move through this over eight. Can you please work harder to get through your overs faster? So it's about how you deliver that message. It's about how you talk to people. It's about how you treat them. And central to that is respect. Yeah, exactly. um, and, and, you, and you talk with them. You don't talk down to them. Right. And, and you try to manage those situations as best you can with the use of empathy and listening skills. And then if you still need to make a tough decision, well, you make it. And say, so, unfortunately, to tender, that's the situation today. You are too overshort. We've given you a number of warnings. You haven't responded. That's where we're left with. You know, so it's probably the best way I can answer that question. Definitely, definitely. And, and I think it's really heartening of uh, Titenda, you know, to, to make that nice guy claim because, uh, you know, as fans, Simon, and uh, if I might digress just a little bit, you know, the, the, the Aussie uh, cricket team of the late 90s, early 2000s always had the reputation of, you know, playing the game hard and fair. And so... That was always the impression that you got for any Australian, but you know, Australian and nice guy in the same sentence, you know, and you you are one of those people who does embody that. So I think that in itself is such a amazing you know achievement, if I may say so. I'm a, one thing that I really enjoy and reflect on with um, great humility as well from the game of cricket in my career has been not the big games or necessarily the big matches and, and appointments, but so much being able to walk away from a period of involvement in the game and have the respect to people like Tatenda or even like Sachin Tendulkar and to be able to reach out to Sachin and say, look, um, I know that I haven't always got you right. I know that I always haven't given you the right decision, but I'm doing this project. Would you be able to be involved in it? Could you write the foreword to the book? And to have a respectful working relationship with those sorts of people and have them respond um, gives me a, an enormous sense of achievement in terms of um, of outcome. Yeah, um, and to have and and to and to earn people's respect, um, I think you can't ask for anything more as a colleague, as a worker, as a uh, as a friend, or whatever. Um, that's probably one of the highlights of my career. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and of course, uh, for our viewers and listeners who haven't read the book yet, you know, the forward to the book was written by Sachin Tendulkar. And speaking of which, uh, for our viewers and listeners uh, who are still with us and, and uh, listening and watching this, we will have uh, Sachin Tendulkar's biographer, Boria Mojumdar, on the show. It's going to be the episode right after this one. So, uh, you know, Simon, if I were to uh, uh, take this opportunity to have you ask a question to Boria, uh, Sachin's biographer. Uh, would you like to put in a question for him that we can ask on your behalf during the episode so that we'll get a chance to link the two episodes together? Oh, um, so uh, I always like asking these sorts of questions to successful people, but uh, if he was to have his career over again, what would he do differently and why? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, awesome, great question. So it will be really uh, waiting to see how, you know, Boria Mojumdar answers that question on behalf of Sachin. So yeah, um, so Simon, uh, just uh, one more, uh, just two more questions and then we'll let you go and be respectful of your time because you've really been very generous with it so far. And so uh, the next uh, guest question that we have is from somebody else who's also a, who was a guest on the show. And his name is Barrister Yasser Latif Hamdani. He's a Pakistani national and uh, he's the author of the book, Jinnah, A Life. And I actually reached out to him for a question because he also happens to be a resident of the city of Lahore, uh, where the terrible tragedy had taken place. And so uh, the question that uh, Yasser Latif Hamdani has for you is, uh, Dear Simon, as a Lahori, I am sorry that you were so poorly treated by my city. It was a terrible time in our history. Cricket now has been restored in Pakistan and most teams have visited Pakistan again. Uh, would you say Pakistan is safe for cricket or would you endorse those who still want to boycott Pakistan? So I think that we already did touch upon this question, but, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, Yasser, who took the time to send in the question, you know, uh, do please go ahead, Simon. Uh, look, it's a hard judgment for me to make uh, here sitting in Sydney when I'm not actually living in, um, in Lahore right now. But just to briefly expand upon what I said before about visiting Pakistan a few years back, I rang Alimdar, I rang 
our son Raza, I rang a few other people who are based in Lahore and, and living in Karachi as well. And I said, look, I've been invited to come back to Pakistan. What do you think? You know, tell me honestly, tell me, is it safe to come back? And they said, yes, it is. And and I think when you have a relationship and a friendship with people like that, there has to be some trust. And I'd like to think, well, cricket has, has been playing there for a few years now with PSL, for example, and various tours. Um, I do note that there is some unrest at the moment politically there with Imran Khan and a few other things. So I think we should always be alert but not alarmed. So even if I said I think it's safe now, it might not be safe tomorrow or the day after. Or there's other uh, violence and conflict going on around the world as well. So to single out Lahore or Pakistan is probably um, never a great thing. So at the moment, um, the word that I get from my colleagues and friends is that it's safe. And I've spoken to Joel Wilson the other day who just completed a series there, a one-day series, and he said he had a great time and it was fine. Um, so at the moment, it is. Um, we never know what the future holds. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and I think that's very well said. And so really, uh, uh, I think the fans in Pakistan will be very heartened, uh, Simon, with you, uh, for your support. Okay, so Simon, uh, we're right at the cusp of uh, ending this episode. But just before we really let you go, uh, we have one staple question that we have on the show that we like to ask all of our uh, guests. And the question is, uh, I've been told it's a tough one, but I do hope that you'll be able to give us a good answer to this one. If you could select a book that you feel that every young person should read at yep. least once in their lifetime, it does. It may or may not be related to cricket or self-development. Uh, no. What would be that one particular book that you would recommend that everybody in the world should read at least once in their lifetime? Mm. Hard to narrow it down. I've read so many good ones and that have really had an impact on me. Um, one book that comes to mind that I found really hard to put down, and maybe it's because it's related to what I do, but it's a book called Legacy by James Kerr. It's a bit of an insight into the New Zealand Rugby League, Rugby Union team, the All Blacks, mm -hmm. and it's about culture and it's about some of the stuff that we've talked about today. Um, and it gives an insight into the importance of the All Blacks jersey and how people really performed above their potential because it was about serving the jersey. It was about serving the game and, and the tradition of the All Blacks. Um, and and I, I really, as I said, I found that hard to put down. And I think it's about character as well. And it's about, um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm really big on leadership and, and really big on, on serving. And that's what leadership really is about. It's about serving other people. So I'd really recommend a book called Legacy by James Kerr. Um, it, it teaches you a bit more about sport, more than sport, um, more about what it takes to be successful and um, some of those intangibles that make a tangible difference. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. And uh, and of course, uh, we would be doing a disservice to our viewers and listeners, Simon, if we didn't put in a plug for your consultancy firm as well, and you have the T-shirt on, uh, you know, integrity with leadership. So would you like to take this opportunity to tell us a little bit more about the firm and what you're doing with that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, not a paid advertisement, but, but basically I work together with a couple of other colleagues and we, we help uh, corporate teams, we help um, sporting teams, match official teams, just really go to that next level and, and take a good hard look at what they're doing and the way that they're doing it and, and try to improve, you know, leadership. Um, but also the integrity is really important, which is always connected to their values. So, again, no rocket science here, but it's all about those things that we've talked about today. Mm -hmm, for sure. And if uh, anybody who's watching or listening to this wanting to get in touch uh, with you for your services, uh, what would be the best way to reach out to you? Uh, they can either do it through Integrity's Values Leadership um, or they can probably look me up on LinkedIn and send me a message. Okay. All right. So cool. So LinkedIn. And so, so we'll definitely have that in the description. And we'll encourage everybody to, uh, to get in touch with you over LinkedIn. Okay, so for our viewers and listeners who have been with us all this time, firstly, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you know, uh, we really appreciate all the support that we've gotten for the show. And uh, before we conclude, let me just grab the book from behind me. <laughs> uh, so the book, once again, is Finding the Gaps, uh, Transferable Skills to Be the Best You Can Be by Umpire Simon Taufel. It's a fantastic book written by a fantastic author, so please go out and buy it. And uh, if Simon does have any other books uh, in the pipeline, be sure to get those as well. By the way, that is a question that I should have asked you, Simon. Do you have any other books 
that are that are up in the pipeline or any future ideas? I, I don't intend to write another book at this stage, but you know, never say never. Um, but I've got uh, a couple more series coming up at the moment. Uh, there's a good chance I might be involved in the Major League Cricket Tournament coming up in the US uh, in July. I'm continuing to do some work with Fairbreak, uh, having just come back from Hong Kong with a series there, and they've got a US series happening in September, which should be very exciting. And I'm still doing some work with the ICC uh, Cricket Academy in Dubai, where I've developed a, an umpire accreditation course with them. And We've finished uh, doing level two, so we hope to launch and release that in the second half of this year. So, yep, plenty to do. Okay, awesome. Well, I can only say that World Cricket is only going to benefit from your experience and your knowledge, Simon. So, uh, so once again, uh, everybody, the book is uh, Finding the Gaps by Simon Tafel. Do please go out and get it. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. And, and thank you as well, Simon. You've been a wonderful guest. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And I really do hope that you have an opportunity to come visit Taka again soon, you know, and, and share your the wealth of knowledge that you have uh, with us and our community and our country. So, yes, uh, all the best to you and everything that you're doing. And I really hope to have you back for a future episode, if and when you do write your next book. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Simon. So you have a nice day and uh, we'll catch up soon. Yeah.